Play mode. Hello, my name is Benjamin Lee, and I just want to welcome everyone. It is now 1 p.m. Eastern Time, so we'll begin our presentation shortly. Today on October 5th, we'll have our presentation on Hazard Mitigation Planning in Nebraska. For help during today's webcast, please feel free to type your questions in the chat box found in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen or call 1-800-263-6317. For content questions, please feel free to type those in the questions box and we'll be able to answer after the presentation. Here is a list of the sponsoring chapters, divisions, and universities. I'd like to thank all of the participating chapters, divisions, and universities for making these webcasts possible. These are the list of upcoming webcasts. To register for these upcoming webcasts, please feel free to uh, visit utahapa.org webcast.htm and register for your webcast of choice. We're now offering distance education webcast to help you get your ethics or law credits before the end of the year. These webcasts are available to view at utahapa.org webcast archive. To log your distance edu education CM credits, go to planning.org slash CM. Select Activities by Provider, select APA Ohio Chapter, then select Distance Education and select your webcast of choice. Follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook. Uh, to receive up-to-date information on the planning webcast series sponsored by chapters, divisions, and universities. We also upload the previous presentations on YouTube. Sub subscribe us on Planning Webcast. To log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, please go to planning.org slash CM, select today's date, October 5th, and then select today's webcast. This webcast is available for 1.5 CM credit. We are recording today's webcast, and it will be available along with a six-slide per page PDF of, pre of the presentation at utahapa.org webcast archive. At this time, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Jeff. Uh, Jeff Ray recently joined JEO as the planning department manager. Jeff came to JEO from the city of Fremont. He was the community, community development director and was re responsible for the planning, building and safety, city facilities, and code enforcement functions for the city. He has over 19 years of experience in both the public and private sectors. Jeff is the client point of contact, has a proven track record of responsiveness, managing projects with multiple stakeholders, significant public involvement, and aggressive timelines. And now I'll hand it over to Jeff. I'm not quite sure who that guy was you described, but uh, it sounded awful like like me. So, welcome everyone. This is for hazard mitigation planning in Nebraska. Um, it's a little bit more unique than some of the other states that I've experienced. Um, if you have questions, please uh, fill out the questions. We'll try to answer them as we go along, and if not, we will answer them at the end. So today, the items that we're going to cover is an overview of hazard mitigation planning in general, some of the funding opportunities that are there, how hazard mitigation planning first started in Nebraska. We were a little bit slower than some of the other states. What some of those update requirements are now that most of the communities in Nebraska are going through their second round of hazard mitigation plans. An item that we refer to as advanced plans. Um, and one thing that's unique in Nebraska is our public power districts. And then finally, we'll conclude with other questions. So as many of you know, there are four phases to emergency management. 
However, this isn't always clear to all of the planners. So as we work with planners in communities, we often work with their emergency managers too. These are the four phases of preparedness, response, recovery, and ultimately mitigation. The mitigation is involved in all four of these and is the primary focus of today's topic. <clears throat> we often get asked, why should someone develop a hazard mitigation plan? Well, there are several reasons for that. Um, the D Disaster Mitigation Act of 2000 requires it for communities and overall as a community planner, it makes your community more resilient and can reduce loss of life and property damage. It helps you identify what your natural hazards are. It can create some constraints, particularly in regards to land use and growth development or redevelopment within communities. And those constraints often roll into opportunities. Another component that's there is that it makes you eligible then for the federal grant funding. You must have an approved hazard mitigation plan and it must be adopted by your local agency and you must have participated in the development of that hazard mitigation plan to be eligible for those grant activities. Now those grant activities are funded at 75 percent by FEMA and some states actually contribute a little bit more. We work some in Iowa and they contribute an additional 10 percent when it's available. Here in Nebraska, the, the Nebraska Emergency Management does not contribute anything else. But most importantly, mitigation works. Not only does it help save lives and property, but in 2006, they determined that for every $1 spent by FEMA on hazard mitigation, that's hazard mitigation projects, it provides the nation with up to $4 in future benefits so that it doesn't have to pay out when those disasters strike. So what actually is hazard mitigation? According to FEMA, hazard mitigation means it's any action taken to reduce or eliminate the long-term risk of human life or property. So when we're dealing with emergency managers, it's often confusing to them as to what a hazard mitigation plan is because they confuse it with their emergency response plans and their other plans that they have. Here you can see one of the uh, nice tornadoes that we get out here on the Great Plains. Some examples of the mitigations that would potentially come out of a hazard mitigation plan are this example here of some bank stabilization. You can see the eroding that would, has been taking place and then what comes back with the riprap in there to protect the property and ultimately the infrastructure. Local drainage, clearance of channels after debris and storms, um, local, localized channelization that takes place in the swales adjacent to some of the streets culvert replacement and work to prevent this localized flooding. Oftentimes we also get involved with acquisition and removal of houses that were constructed in the flood plain with numerous creeks and rivers. This is a very popular program here in Nebraska. We also have tornadoes. Um, tornadoes spawn um, quite often off of large thunderstorms and can cause massive damage. Safe rooms are considered a mitigation. We have several school districts that participate in the hazard mitigation plans in Nebraska as well as local communities that ultimately build safe rooms to provide a safe shelter to ride out that storm. Also in the Great Plains we have um, snow and ice with high winds. Some of those mitigations are necessary, undergrounding utilities to keep critical facilities up and operational, as well as to just keep power re going to homes so they can maintain their heat during those cold winter spells. So what exactly is hazard mitigation planning? As I mentioned earlier, it was part of the Disaster Mitigation Action of 2000. And it's a pre-disaster plan, similar to comprehensive plans that are done in the community. It's a guidance document that's set forward to make a specific action come out. Here our ultimate action will be the protection of life and property and development of mitigations. Some other things that come out of that are also the eligibility and the participation of it um, for FEMA funding. The hazard mitigation funding that we talk about 
Um, we often talk about the pre-disaster program or the PDM. Um, no disaster is required to receive that funding. Um, some disasters um, that are declared with a presidential then have a set aside to provide for those additional fundings. There's also the Flood Mitigation Assistance Program and the um, National Flood Insurance Program. So that the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program is a result of what I referred to earlier, those disasters when they happen. So you have a presidential declaration of a particular area that triggers a funding. 15% of that overall project that's funded then because of that disaster rolls back into the local state to be used for planning activities and mitigation. And it's based upon of each disaster. Two years ago, Nebraska experienced substantial flooding along the Missouri River and received about $1.5 million in disaster planning grants uh, or funding available for planning grants. This year, there have been no declaration, presidential declarations. So the following year in 2013, there will not be any of that funding available to the state. Recently, we got some data from FEMA. And this shows the top 10 states that shows their unobligated funds. So if your state is listed on here, there may be a substantial amount of money out there for your community to pursue hazard mitigation planning as well as hazard mitigation projects to make, those, make your communities more resilient and mitigate from those natural disasters, and make your communities a little bit stronger. Now in Nebraska, when we started in 2007, um, we did single jurisdiction plans. Those single jurisdiction plans represented in each individual community. Each individual communities were not able to really do much with those plans. They didn't have an idea of what they should do with them, and they ended up ultimately just sitting on the shelf. And the plan was very similar to the community that was next door. Uh, Nebraska obviously is a rural state. We have numerous jurisdictions and the majority of our population is actually in the eastern portion of the state covering a very small footprint. So we had a, a massive amount of documents that was really unwieldy to manage from the emergency management perspective and then started doing the multi-jurisdictional plans. Not only were those single jurisdiction plans um, repetitive and hard to manage, um, but they didn't coordinate with anybody adjacent to them if they did want to do a project. So anybody upstream or downstream from a flood protection project that they put in was not included in part of their plan, and they would have to do their own plans individually. So ultimately, the plans just sat on the shelf. Um, they may be good plans, but they didn't do anything to the communities to help them and help the people of the community, or even really educate the people of the community what to do. So in Nebraska, we're unique in the country. We have natural resource districts based upon our watershed boundaries. And we started doing multi-jurisdictional plans based off of the natural resource districts. Um, and this made a lot of sense for several reasons. One, it definitely fit with the mission of the natural resource districts, or the NRDs as we refer to them, to conserve and to sustain and improve the natural resources in the environment. Now the major natural resource that we often have here in Nebraska is along our rivers and our streams. So the NRD was the one that was responsible for the maintenance of those facilities and that natural resource today. And it only made sense that they would become the agency in charge of this. They are also a local sub-taxing subdivision with local property tax. So as individuals often ask, what does the NRD do for me? This is one thing that the NRD points back to in their hazard mitigation plans and points to them and says, this is something how we're protecting you as a community and how these projects that lap over city and county boundaries um, help overall for the entire water basin and not just one particular jurisdiction. Here you can see a map of the, the 30 natural resource districts in Nebraska and how they're set up. They do cross.
to the, to the general citizens, but most people understand what the Natural Resource District does and how they're laid out and what Natural Resource District they're in based off of their property tax bill. Some of the additional benefits there were they just covered large chunks of populations and we didn't have a significant number of plans sitting out there on the shelves that nobody was tracking. We also work in Iowa and they had upwards which didn't work for anyone. It was simply just a paperwork process of shuffling plans back and forth and getting them updated when they needed to be updated. So the two largest population-wise NRDs in Nebraska are the Papio Missouri River NRD, which covers the eastern portion of the state, and the city of Omaha, and the Lower Platte South NRD, which is directly west of there and covers um, the city of Lincoln. Together, those two populations cover about 54% of Nebraska's population, but less than 10% of its actual footprint. So these were all based upon watersheds, and it made sense um, because of the urban nature of these particular NRDs, as well as the rural nature of the other NRDs, that the NRD would actually take over and manage the floodplain component. They also had years of experience in dealing with the flood issues, trying to protect not only the surface water, but also the groundwater as the Ogallala Aquifer runs under Nebraska, and it's one of the greatest natural resources that the state has. And it is also responsible for our agricultural economy with the irrigation and everything that takes place there. So there are regulations that not only control the surface water, but control the groundwater and prevent the contaminations between the two. So they made an obvious choice to be able to do multi-jurisdictional plans and become the sponsors of those plans, and they also fit under what FEMA's definitions were for local jurisdictions. <clears throat> so they were able to utilize and be cost-effective and efficient by creating one much larger plan over a broad area and not having lots of little plans scattered throughout the state that expired at various times and contained um, efforts that weren't um, coordinated across those jurisdictional lines. And it was able to save the community as well as the state lots of dollars because they had one much larger project and they received an economy of scale. So the HMP process and how we've able, been able to develop that here in Nebraska it's fairly simple and it's a very traditional planning process. You have your initial project kickoff meeting with the interested parties, local electeds, invite the local public and have public meetings. Dependent upon the NRD's actual area, we will often have multiple meetings that cover public participation to, not, to avoid having to travel long distances. In addition to that, we are now um, trying to apply some social media aspects, um, utilizing Facebook, MindMixer, and some of those other online programs that are able to solicit individuals' input and allow them to participate in the program without actually attending the town hall meetings. So after our initial pick up, kickoff goes in, then we get our public involvement from that, and we ask, they fill out their forms, and we go through the draft analysis of what everyone contributed to make sure we have a complete picture of all of the natural hazards that have occurred in that area, develop that form, produce it back and give it back to the community so that they can take a good look at it, give them about 30 days to review it, hold another big public meeting to allow them to look at it again and then finalize the plan and ultimately send it on to the Nebraska Emergency Management for their review and forwarding on to FEMA for their approval. Upon FEMA's approval, then it comes back to those local jurisdictions to adopt and start to implement. The plan consists of two major components, or two major sections as we refer to it. The upfront section are some of the general requirements, the documentation of the planning process, who participated, which community participated, 
what those communities look like, what are their populations, what are their critical facilities that they have, what hazards were identified, and is that truly a risk? And we try to quantify all of those, develop some mitigation strategies that are general to there. And then we have the participant section, where it's individualized to each particular jurisdiction, whether it's a city or a county or the school district um, that participate in that um, exact plan, and then they roll up into the bigger plan. So in Nebraska, these are the potential hazards that we analyze. You can see the fire on the right. We obviously have quite a few of those with our high winds that heat up during the summer and our grass, grass wildland and grass fires that, that pick up. Tornadoes, floods, landslides. We have dam failures, winter storms. Uh, we also are starting to look now at hazards from man-made hazards, the natural hazards, as well as the natural hazards you look at. So you can see that the, the couple natural hazards that aren't on here, uh, we have a very small threat of earthquakes, but the ones that aren't on here are the hurricanes and the coastal surge. If we end up with a coastal surge in Nebraska, the country's got a lot bigger problems than uh, we're ever going to have to worry about on a hazard mitigation plan. By the time the hurricanes actually reach Nebraska, they've been um, severely downgraded and have just come in the uh, form of thunderstorms with maybe producing some tornadoes. So after everything has been identified and we've done our community profile and determined the historical occurrences through our research with the local community and conversations with the local electeds and the emergency managers and looking back off of the historic research that is available. We go into a structural inventory and we determine their vulnerability and their analysis and do our full risk assessment to determine what those potential losses could be and try to quantify them. One of the tools that is utilized in the GIS basis is a HAZIS program that allows you to determine what some of those losses are with a 100-year floodplain. Um, utilizing the census data and all of the power of GIS behind you and what you can do and determine the actual valuation um, and frequency of those losses. We also do a structural inventory to determine the types of uses that would be impacted. Would it take out any critical facilities? Are they residential? Are they nursing homes? Are they schools? The, those types of uh, public structures that are there. Um, that would potentially be taken out within a flood. We also identify those critical facilities, not only for, for the floods, but for other hazards, um, the high winds and tornadoes, um, man-made hazards. Who are the vulnerable populations, maybe nursing homes, um, schools, emergency shelters? Try to identify all of those locations on your mapping program with your assessment to determine what their vulnerability is. After all of that process is done, you try to come up with a range of mitigation that is very broad. It starts with just general community education. Where do I go during a flood? Where do I go during a tornado? What do I do during a snowstorm? What items do I need to keep with me in my vehicle when I travel? Some of those very simple type things, as well as working with the local Chamber of Commerce to help businesses come up with contingency disaster plans, uh, replication of records that are necessary, um, do some emergency management training with the local leaders, not just necessarily um, the emergency managers and the local fire enforcement and or law enforcement and volunteer fire departments, but also with those individuals that work for communities so they know what they're supposed to do and when they're supposed to do it. And then coordinate on a regional level. When your town, and many of our towns are very small, when they ha are impacted, the entire, in the entire community will be impacted. So we encourage communities to create sister relationships with other communities so when those disasters do strike, your sister community can come in and establish what's necessary to be done and follow your mitigations um, and follow your post-disaster plans. But we 
put that up front in the pre-disaster planning because that's the place where it makes more sense and you can actually coordinate all of those on an upfront effort. And all of these mitigations ultimately roll back into the state plan and into the FEMA framework. We also try to identify any funding that's necessary for any of those mitigations. There's substantial amount of funding that is out there, not only from FEMA, but a lot of non-FEMA support too, um, not only just in dollars, but training and information, um, educational programs. People will come out to your community and, and talk to you about firewise communities, how to, how to build um, rain gardens, all of those different types of things that can be utilized to help minimize the impact of any particular natural disaster. Now, FEMA's updates or FEMA's require requirements on hazard mitigation plans I talked about a little bit earlier now in Nebraska is all going into their second and sometimes third plan. Um, we've now all gone to these multi-jurisdictional plans. They have to be updated every five years um, to be relevant and to continue to be eligible for those plant those project funds from FEMA we suggest to all of the individual communities that they start doing that at least 24 months in advance because it takes about eight, 12 to 18 months to actually complete a new hazard mitigation plan update. And you need to allow sufficient time for NEMA and FEMA to allow for their approval process so that they can review the plan, uh, make any changes that are necessary to the to the plan, get it back to the communities, and then a plan will actually be adopted and put into place for the community, and then they can start their implementation. So there's been some changes since the first plans have come out in 2009. Um, we had the pres presidential directive, or PPD-8, um, that set out some more national preparedness goals that were a little bit broader, where you include the entire community and don't just focus necessarily on the emergency management portion of it. It also set out a framework for the quantitative risk assessment and how that was to be done, and really put a focus on mitigation projects, not the actual planning process, but on mitigation. How do we make communities more resilient? How do we keep people out of the floodplain? How do we keep them out of harm's way and make people safer and have a much more viable community? FEMA has also changed their review tool, which just took place this October. Um, you no longer go through the crosswalk. It's much more, uh, 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 it's an easier process now. Um, it allows a little bit more flexibility. And I'm not sure if it's nationwide, but at least in Region 7 of FEMA, we're now keeping track of a project mitigation database. Not only are we trying to figure out what other communities are doing, but we're trying to pass on best practices to those other communities. But also, we want to know what is being done, or are, these, are our plans just sitting on the shelf as they were before. It's our experience here in Nebraska that plans are actually now being implemented. And as we come back to update these new plans, we're seeing that projects are actually on the ground and in place, and that the communities are in better position than they were five years ago. The other major component that was included recently is now the man-made threats, um, both accidental and um, terrorist type threats um, are now being included in hazard mitigation plans. So as we look at the new update and figure out how do you best create reduction of risk and make your communities more resilient, we try to include the entire community where prior to that it was maybe just the local elected and the emergency management folks that were involved. Now we reach out to the entire community, hold broad public meetings, utilize some of those social networking um, sites that are out there to try to get more people involved, to get a broader awareness of the natural hazards, as well as an understanding of what they can do and locally, um, as well as individually within their businesses and their homes. So as I mentioned earlier, 
the traditional plan we have found from some of our clients tended to just sit on the shelf. And as we talked with our clients about that, we found that the impediment to them was actually applying for the grant because the cost of putting together that grant application was a risk to them and their budgets were so short and so small that they could not risk that type of funding. Typically, we have found that it takes about $25,000 for a community to put together that grant application. And that grant, or, or, traditionally under the plan, it didn't include any engineering or cost-benefit analysis or site review or any of those types of things. And that burden came upon all of those communities. So we worked with, with NEMA here in Nebraska and FEMA, you know, to Region 7 out of Kansas City and our clients to come up with what we refer to as the advanced plan con concept or a pre-screening pre process where the projects that were identified are actually able to be thought out a little bit further and we develop a pre-application package for those individual communities. We go through a screening process of that to determine if we think it's going to meet that cost-benefit analysis and give them a range. So if we know that it's very close to one, the community may not pursue it. If it's much higher than one, we know that it's going to be a good project for the community and there may be a substantial cost benefit. We also do a preliminary environmental review and the other supporting documents, documentation that's necessary there are any historical buildings involved. And we help the community prioritize which, which project will have the best bang for the buck, which one can they actually afford and what year will they actually be able to afford? Because most of these communities are small and aren't able to do multiple projects in one year. So the, the advanced plan concept helps them and puts an emphasis actually on implementation to make the communities more resilient. And it helps them prioritize. It doesn't go all the way to developing the plan because we can't get all the way into uh, plans and project development um, under, the, under the federal guidelines, that would be the next phase upon the grant actually being approved. But it helps the community. And at the end of the day, when their plan is approved, they're ready to go with a grant application shortly after that if the community believes that that's their best interest to move forward. Because about 60% of their grant application will have already been completed under the original planning phase with the hazard mitigation plan. <clears throat> Here is a typical example for a community where they were having a drainage project and under the original drainage project their grant application fees were about $25,000 to put that together. And this was all a burden upon the local community and all 100% at risk upon the local community if that grant application when they get done doesn't meet the cost-benefit analysis or FEMA for some reason does not fund that project. So under the advanced plan concept, um, the, the community then would put forward an approximately a, a total amount of $15,000 for the completion of that project or FEMA and the local match share of the 75, 25% the local community actually is only risking $3,750. At that point, they know or have a very good idea if that project would actually be funded and is feasible for them to move forward with. At that point, then they could complete the application with that additional $10,000 and have a completed application for less money than they would have originally done it but they also had a break in between after they spent less than $4,000 to understand really well, is this a feasible project for the community and it, so far we've had several communities take advantage of this type of planning exercise and going further into the implementation phase. <clears throat> Overall nationally the hazard mitigation plans you can see here and how they're distributed and um, what those funding sources have gone to. Um, the vast majority has gone for acquisition and removal out of the floodplain um, and the stormwater management. Obviously from a hazard mitigation perspective it's much easier to predict where the water is going to go along a creek or a stream or river um, and identify that floodplain 
as opposed to where the tornado is going to hit or when a severe ice or windstorm hits. Those things are a little bit unpredictable and generally take out a much larger swath. So in conclusion, we're encouraging our communities to not only team together and work together on a regional basis with the um, natural resource districts, but to really put their focus on implementation of the plan. As we work through the process and through the public meetings, we want good, solid ideas and try to identify those local individuals that will then step up and be the champions for those local projects. And many of them know, know of and are aware of several drainage issues that they've had over the years, but just don't have an idea how to tackle it from a funding perspective. And through their participation in the hazard mitigation plan, it creates that opportunity for them to do it. The other thing we encourage them to do is allow ample time to do a good hazard mitigation plan. Don't try to slam it together in the last six months before your other plan expires, but allow up to two years to get an early start and really include the public as much as possible. And then we also include, include, consider that pre-screening process or those advanced plans to get the projects a little bit closer to actually application for a grant to get them moving a little bit forward and don't allow the grant application process being the impediment to that. And then we share our ideas with other communities um, and other natural resource districts throughout the state. Um, and we do this not only in Nebraska, but also in Iowa, South Dakota, and Missouri. Um, so we try to share those as best as possible. So with that, there's my contact information. And I will take questions as they come up. Uh, yeah, so we have a couple questions here. Um, the first question is from John. Have you considered including a uh, Yellowstone volcano eruption? John, that's a good question. No, we have, we have not considered um, volcanic activity here in Nebraska. Yellowstone would probably be about our closest. However, when Mount St. Helens did erupt, um, obviously way out on the west coast, um, it did impact um, most of the country with the, that ash. Um, it is definitely something that, uh, that we could note and um, should be considered. Um, there is also uh, you know, activities that take place halfway around the world and um, you know, in China when there's major fires or dust storms that, that affect us here in our air quality. Um, but uh, we have not considered those in our hazard mitigation plans to date. And second question is uh, from Anissa. How was environment justice addressed in your planning and how was it included in the final plan? Ben, could you repeat that question more time, please? Okay. How was environmental justice addressed in your planning and how was it included in the final plan? On the, on the natural hazard side, we, we do not look at uh, the environmental justice components. Um, those are done on other federal projects that we work on as well as some of our comprehensive plans. But the natural hazards don't look at the population base. They only address that natural hazard and a population that would potentially be there. Um, and we do not look at anything else uh, beyond that. So we don't really address it from an environmental justice perspective. Uh, next question. Uh, can you give an example of an HMP identified mitigation project? Um, sure. I mean, there are specific communities now that are building um, tornado shelters uh, within schools, within new schools, particularly as new schools move forward. Those school districts will apply for FEMA funding to build a safe room uh, where they can seek refuge during those storms. As tornadoes come about, uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with them, um, there's typically a, a time period of warning 
of a matter of minutes to a matter of hours uh, before a tornado would actually strike. Um, and the siren systems that go off, which would also be a mitigation. Um, there's a, the civil defense type sirens that cover um, large portions of the community. Those sirens go off and, and warn you to take cover. Um, and then you could seek cover in those safe rooms. Um, additional residents um, could seek that coverage. We also have a requirement in Nebraska for our mobile home parks to have safe rooms um, for tornadoes because um, that particular housing choice um, is particularly vulnerable to high winds and tornadoes. We've also done um, fortification of stream beds around critical bridges to help uh, prevent erosion during those high waters and maintain that bridge um, so the community can maintain access in and out of the community. Okay, next question is from James. What do you think are the key reasons funding is not being fully utilized? That's a, that's a great question, and we've asked that question too. Oftentimes we've found that the, most of our communities either they have constrained budgets and they're just not able to put funding towards that because they deem something else to be a higher priority. But what is often this case is they just don't have personnel to do it. We're dealing with small communities that maybe have one or two people on full-time staff, they have volunteer fire departments, and the manpower just plain isn't there to be able to do it within the local jurisdictions here. That's why when we went to the multi-jurisdictional plans based off of the natural resource districts where they have staffs of 10, 20, 30, 40 people, they were able to do more of the projects and actually start applying for some of those types of things and take that burden off of the local jurisdiction and take it on in a bigger basis. But I think it's, I think it's a, a factor of budgets and willingness and awareness for in some cases in just plain education that those opportunities are available and there's actual substantial amount of funding out there based off of natural disasters that have happened previously. Next question is from Matthew. How do you ensure that the plan does not just stay on the shelf like before? How many mock events are conducted per year to keep the plans and the processes in the plans fresh in the minds of municipalities? Uh, we, we really don't have a way to uh, ensure that they don't just sit on the shelf. Um, not only are we a, a planning firm, but we're also an engineering firm. So my engineers who establish these relationships and continue to work as city engineers and county engineers in these areas continue to push these projects forward with the community um, when they're working on, on all aspects of the city engineering, whether they're working on roads, they'll bring the drainage in, and try to try to address it from a comprehensive perspective and work with them as they're establishing their capital improvement plans each year and go back and review them. The local emergency managers do their mock drills. Um, we don't get involved with, with their mock drills um, because we're on the pre-disaster side and trying to put things in place prior to the disaster actually taking place. So I, I really can't answer how many, how often they do the, the mock training. Um, I do hear about it quite a bit from our emergency managers that we work with on the, on the pre-disaster planning side, though. The yeah, next question is, uh, does all new pavement require stormwater retention to reduce downstream flooding? It, it doesn't necessarily require retention or detention. It does, we do have state law, obviously, that requires the increased flow to not, or the flow to not be increased with new pavement as it goes in. Typically, most of my communities that we work in here um, don't increase the flow substantially, and there's not a, uh, a tremendous pressure to, to pave large swaths of, of the area other than in a couple communities in Nebraska where they are experiencing substantial growth. And those individual communities have their, 
their water quality and quantity control measures and regulations in place um, that the Department of Natural Resources um, at the state level works on in Department of Environmental Quality. Um, so they do control all of those um, and that is helping um, help control some of those storm surges as they do um, come off of those impervious services. We also encourage um, the locals in the, in the residential area as well as new commercial development to take place and there's a substantial push in Nebraska now to put in some um, green infrastructure uh, to try to retain as much water on site and to get it to percolate back down into the aquifers that are here and continue to recharge those and not just um, put it into a, a concrete channel. Um, most of our creeks and rivers and all of that aren't paved. Um, they, they do allow for that, uh, that natural flow. We, uh, we're, we're abundantly blessed with lots of natural open space that um, is great for agriculture and we, we don't have a substantial problem with water runoff from um, major urban areas except for in a few cases. Your next question is from James. Are there requirements to make these plans available on the net? Uh, I am unaware of any requirement to uh, make the plans available on the internet. Um, some communities are putting them on the internet. Uh, when we create a plan for a community, we we provide them in a, with not only hard copies but with a complete digital version which allows them to do what they want to do with it. If they want to continue to um, control it um, or if they want to distribute it or put it out on their website, then and that is their local option. As we move into identification of threats in critical facilities, there are going to be portions of those plans that are not going to be widely available to the public um, for um, security purposes. Uh, do codes require new buildings to have windstorm protection? In, in Nebraska, the, code, the, the codes that most people use are the Uniform Building Code and the International Building Codes. Um, the issue that we run into here is that many rural communities, uh, meaning the, probably two-thirds of the state, don't actually enforce the building codes and don't actually issue building permits. They will issue a zoning permit for a new structure. However, the contractor or local individual building that will then sign that they will adhere to those, um, to those codes and they specify the year and which uh, update of that particular code that they utilize. But it does address um, the high wind shears and um, the requirements that are necessary um, to uh, secure the building to the foundation um, within, those, within the building codes. Would a large spill from a major oil natural gas pipeline be covered under man-made hazards? Uh, yeah, that would definitely be a man-made hazard and a very current issue here in Nebraska with the XL Keystone, um, Keystone pipeline being proposed coming through. Um, and it's a, it's a hot, very hot topic and um, that would uh, be one of those security threats as well as a a natural or an accidental um, spill, either one could be uh, very catastrophic to the Ogallala Aquifer or the local community where that happens. So um, there's going to be a lot of attention paid to um, any additional proposed pipelines that continue to come across Nebraska. There are already some and those pipelines have been included in um, those hazard mitigation plans previously from a threats perspective, which um, the local jurisdiction um, deals with. Does land development require floodway protection and floodplain uh, compensation? Um, the, the, the state regulations 
prohibit development within the floodplain, within the 100-year floodplain in Nebraska. And it's up to the local jurisdictions to enforce that with their zoning permits and their building permits if they issue building permits. So um, floodplains are, are, are prohibited for, for development, um, from at least from habitable structures. Um, there are numerous structures that are grandfathered into those. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by the, the floodplain compensation. This question is from Carl. Is the funding you identified just for planning or is it also for implementation? It's for both. There's funding available for the planning at the 75-25 split and there's also um, hazard mitigation grant program for projects that were identified. So there's two separate funding sources there. Um, and the set aside for planning is much smaller than actually for the set aside for the actual projects. This is from James. Is there a process to amend plans prior to updates when new threats or mitigations are identified? No, we have not experienced that, and nor, nor am I aware of any um, uh, requirement to update um, upon any no, new known um, threat. Um, I'm not sure what a, a new threat could potentially come up. Um, obviously, if, if something um, did come up, um, it would probably be analyzed at a local law enforcement level um, and work out um, that with the emergency manager and then be caught up into the next round of hazard mitigation plan updates. Uh, okay, during non-school times, are school emergency facilities open to the public? <laughs> In theory, yes. Um, and, and it has been an issue where the facility is actually supposed to be open to the community 24-7 or be available to the community 24-7 and I know I've worked in some communities now where we there are code locks that are put on the doors where numerous people in the community and neighbors have access to that code to allow that to open. Um, however, there have been situations where those have been locked and nobody has been able to get into them because the individual is not around. But in theory, yes, they're supposed to be open 24-7. Does the DOT or other state agency have their own plans and or participate in local plans? Um, the DOT does not have their own plan. And another very unique thing about Nebraska is all of the public, all of the, di all of the power in Nebraska is controlled by public power districts. It's, none of it is private. We don't have private uh, energy providers here in Nebraska. It's all public. Those are subset of the state government and therefore they are all considered annexes to the state plan um, and they have their own. Um, each individual plan has their own which folds up into uh, the state plan. They also do participate at the local level um, because it is in their best interest to um, make sure that um, their assets um, from a public power district perspective as well as um, the county roads um, and state department of roads that um, protect their bridges and their roads participate just at the local level but they don't have their own individual um, state plan I should say. This is from James. Uh, what is the funding split for the mitigation? Of when the, I, I think I have these numbers right in my head. I should have had these these exact, exact numbers written down. But after the presidential disaster declaration is declared and that total amount is accumulated, it's my understanding that of that total amount, 15% of that total number is set aside for hazard mitigation. That means for projects as well as for planning. Of that number, that 15% that's set aside, I believe 
7.5% of that 15% is for planning purposes. Um, I'm not sure I have the exact numbers, um, but uh, that's, that's my understanding and how the process works. This question is from Doug. Does Nebraska have public above or underground shelters for tornadoes? We have both. Um, some areas of the state, like the area that, that I grew up in, we have um, um, subsurface water very close to the surface, meaning that uh, if the homes actually dug a basement um, 10 feet down, they would have a couple feet of water in their basement every spring when the water rose from the snow melt. Um, so in those particular situations, we will do above ground storm shelters. Um, some people in other parts of the state um, do below ground. Um, sometimes it's a combination of the two where it's partially submerged and then covered um, with a dirt berm. Most of the time now with the larger community safe rooms, particularly in schools, those are fortified walls and roofs um, that are completely above ground. What is the local share in mitigation projects? The, the local share is the 25 percent, um, minimum of 25 percent. They can contribute more, but it is a minimum of 25 percent of that project cost as well as the planning cost. Do the watershed area cross state lines? No, they don't cross state lines, and that's an interesting um, question because we've had that same discussion, particularly with our Papio, Missouri Natural Resource District, which runs the entire length of the eastern portion of the state along the Missouri River, or almost that entire portion. And if you're doing flood control measures on the west side of the river, what does that mean to our friends on the east side of the river, whether in South Dakota or Iowa? Um, and the coordination that's necessary between those two, uh, or those different states, as well as um, there's some uh, metropolitan planning agencies. The two metropolitan planning agencies that we only have in the state are also on that Missouri River corridor. And that tends to be the population base, not only of Nebraska, but also of, of western Iowa, their population base is right along that Missouri River also. So no, there's no coordination really across state lines, nor is there any major coordination that I'm aware of at a, uh, at a uh, state level with Iowa Department of Homeland Security or um, Nebraska Emergency Management. Okay, that's it for the questions. Uh, thank you for a great presentation, Jeff. And um, one of our speakers could not attend today's session, so uh, we'll wrap up here today. And I want to thank everyone for attending today's webcast. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. For those of you who are still in, in attendance, I just want to go through a few reminders. First off, to uh, log off your CM credits for attending today's webcast, please go to planning.org slash CM, select today's date, and then select today's webcast. This webcast is available for 1.5 CM credit. Also, we are recording today's session, so you will be able to find recording of this webcast along with a six slide per page PDF at utahapa.org and also on YouTube. This concludes today's session and I want to thank everyone again for attending. Thank you.